The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. So, so as not to take up any more time from the speakers, let me introduce our first speaker today. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Laura Lowe's. She's with the University of, of Washington in, in Seattle. And she's going to be talking about uh, giving guidance on nonlinear modeling of reinforced concrete buildings. I failed to say that this is part, uh, this is a session that has been sponsored by ACI Committee 369 seismic repair and rehabilitation. So all the topics that you will see here, here are, are uh, related to that general topic. So again, I'm turning, over, turning it over to Dr. Lowe's. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I know this is the last day of the conference, and as I was walking around this morning at 8 o'clock, it seemed pretty quiet. But this is uh, quite an impressive turnout. Hopefully, there's some good information for you today. This first talk that I'm giving, and I am giving to uh, today, <laughs> um, is um, actually presenting the results of a recently completed NIST-funded project that was the ATC 114 project. And um, there were a number of people on that project. So most of the work that I'm presenting today was uh, done by myself and my colleague Don Lehman. Um, and it built on a lot of work of our students over the years. And some of them are listed in this ATC project team. Um, but then I'm also reporting on just some of the information that came out of that project from this large group of people that are listed there at the bottom who participated in the project. Um, as I said, this project was funded by NIST, and the objective was to provide some recommendations that might eventually get incorporated into ASC 41. So where, um, at some level, should ASC 41 go? And there were a number of documents that were produced. There were three documents that provided guidance on nonlinear analysis of buildings for assessment. And there was one that was sort of general guidelines and then two additional documents that provide detailed information about reinforced concrete frames and steel frames. And then there was a, a fourth document that I was most involved in, and um, this was looking specifically at, um, or I should, it was providing guidance on modeling a number of different types of systems. So the first set of documents is really looking at general information about buildings and frames, and then this last one touched on reinforced concrete, steel uh, frames, steel moment resisting frames, steel braced frames, wood, squat walls, slender walls, uh, almost everything. Uh, in terms of uh, reinforced concrete, um, the documents that provide the most information about reinforced concrete are the ones that I've outlined here, um, and obviously this uh, document that's on frames. Um, in these guidelines, um, the guidelines specifically for uh, reinforced concrete frames, so kind of looking back at this one that's in the middle on the bottom there, that is a document that provides guidance on reinforced concrete frames. It is mostly um, discussion of how one might go about building out a model, what you should think about when you're doing an analysis of reinforced concrete frames. There's information about different types of models. Um, the bulk of it is focused on concentrated hinge models and fiber type comp um, hinge models. And so then there's guidance on doing section modeling, et cetera. There's a very, very brief discussion of continuum modeling. Um, and it addresses both new and existing construction. I think what is most interesting, I kind of highlighted here, that's new is some recommendations for where we might move forward or how we might move forward with concentrated hinge models. So this is just looking at an image that comes out of that document that's thinking about where those concentrated hinges might uh, be in a uh, model of a structural system. And you'll note that they're talking about some hinges at the base that might uh, represent some bar slip. There are hinges uh, around a beam column joint, and there's the potential for explicitly or implicitly simulating the uh, flexibility of the joint region. But this is kind of what your lumped plasticity model of this structure would look like. 
And the one thing that comes out of this uh, that is, I think, new to us is use of a concentrated hinge model that actually has peak strength, um, strength degradation, and ductility, which are a function of the load history. So that's really similar to what has been done for, I think, a number of years in the steel frame um, or in modeling steel frames. Um, I'm not sure the extent to which this can be done in commercial software. This can be done pretty easily in research software. And what this document does is suggest that if you have a monotonic uh, loading, you're going to be somewhere on this blue curve. If you have a very, very demanding cyclic load history, then you're going to have responses like this red curve, which would be this red envelope down at the bottom. And then if you have Something that is cyclic uh, load history but not as demanding. You can see this green one that is really only loading in one direction without the full reverse cycle. Then you're going to end up with an envelope that is falling somewhere between the blue and the red. And the idea is that you are, as your analysis goes on, you're monitoring energy dissipation and maybe maximum minimum displacement demand. And so your envelope is adjusting and the rate of strength deterioration is adjusting. Um, Using that modeling approach, the document demonstrates how you can do a really good job of simulating observed response in the laboratory. And these are some data for um, identical columns that were subjected to different load histories. And the document goes on to explain how you might calibrate this Ibarra type model where the envelope and other model parameters deteriorate with the load history, how you would calibrate that given some test data. On the steel side, a lot of work has been done to develop those parameters. On the concrete side, much less work has been done. And so I think, as I said, one of the interesting things that come out, comes out of this particular document is this idea that, hey, this is something that we should be doing for reinforced concrete, and here's some ways that you could take the experimental data and do that. Um, I'm not sure, as I said, the extent to which this is viable uh, in practice, but it is certainly something, uh, if you look at these load histories, there is certainly the impact of the load history on the observed response, and neglecting it is um, a simplification in the model. Beyond that, I think those documents provide a really nice set of uh, a, a really nice reference material for somebody in a student or somebody in your design office who's embarking on uh, doing nonlinear analysis of frames for assessment or, or design. What I was most involved with was another part of that project that was looking at recommendations for how we might advance modeling the nonlinear response of reinforced concrete walls and looking at, I should say, reinforced concrete flexural walls. Um, I'm not going to talk as much about the, um, there are also guidelines for sh squat walls in here, but most of the work I did was on flexural walls. And we looked at uh, experimental data and realized that there were essentially three different failure modes for a flexural wall. You can have a tension controlled failure where your bars fracture. Um, usually that happens when you have light axial load or low longitudinal reinforcement ratios that minimize the amount of compressive demand. You can have compression controlled flexural failure, high axial load, or lots of longitudinal reinforcement that re results in large compressive demands. And you can also have a compression shear failure. And usually that happens with a wall that has a very long cross section and a high shear demand, maybe a high axial load. And it really is where the shear and the flexural demands uh, interact to cause a very large compressive demand. And so you get crushing that would be within uh, the, ex or instead of getting crushing at the extreme fiber, you might actually get crushing out here in a region of the web where there might be less confinement, less longitudinal reinforcement. And uh, given these different failure modes, we're looking for modeling techniques that either simulate these failure modes explicitly or else we need rules that tell us which failure mode is appropriate for the wall that we're looking at. There are a number of different ways of modeling reinforced concrete walls, spanning from the lumped plasticity model that I was talking about uh, at the beginning of the talk out through continuum. The ones I'm going to talk about are uh, lumped plasticity, a, a distributed fiber type model where you have distributed plasticity and a fiber type hinge, and then a model that would be essentially a perform uh, wall model, which is a, uh, essentially a 2D fiber type model. If we look at the, uh, if we look at a uh, 
distributed plasticity model. This is a representation of a force-based fiber type beam column element that might be available on the research platform OpenSeas. Uh, for a wall segment like this, there's an axial load and a shear. We know that the wall is developing a, a linear moment diagram and has a constant axial load. The force-based element formulation assumes that load distribution and then you introduce a bunch of fiber sections that tell you what the curvature and the axial strain at the centroid are at these different heights of the wall. You integrate those, the deformation demands at each of those, or the deformations at each of those sections, and you can do a pretty good job of representing uh, the true distribution in terms of the true curvature distribution on the wall, and then approximating the, the uh, strain at the centroid. Um, so each of those sections has a fiber type flexural section with unconfined concrete fibers, confined concrete fibers, and a whole bunch of steel fibers. You would then layer on some sort of shear section. It could be a linear shear section or it could be a multilinear shear section. Oh, sorry, I think I transferred to the displacement based element. So force based element. Uh, we're doing a pretty good or uh, exact representation of the loads. When we go to a displacement based element, um, now we've got the same wall. The displacement based element assumes a curvature field and a axial strain field. And so here's the approximation of that curvature field at the height. I need multiple elements because each element assumes only a lin linear curvature field and a constant axial strain. So I need multiple elements at the height to represent that curvature field or the axial strain field. Fiber section looks identical as it did for the force based element. This is really almost exactly the same uh, thing that you see when you have a perform type model. Instead of this being a line element that goes from the center here to the center there, now it's essentially a four node quadrilateral. Your section looks exactly the same in plan view. In elevation, it actually has some 2D shape. You've got a linear elastic or maybe a bilinear elastic or slightly nonlinear uh, shear model, and you get exact a very similar representation. For this element, we actually have a constant curvature at each height, and again, you need multiple elements up the height to represent it. So those are the kinds of uh, distributed plasticity elements that are being used in research and practice. Typically, when you take one of these elements, and I have to admit this is what's shown in the ATC uh, 114 document that I talked about at the beginning, you use a typical concrete element where here's the compression response and here's the tension response, but I'm going to say no, you don't want to use that. Uh, what you want to do is use your standard concrete model to represent behavior up to the peak, and then we need to do some work on the post-peak response, and this approach, I. I've probably spoken to a number of you several times on this, but I'll just keep going until it actually gets uh, incorporated into uh, more code documentation. Uh, so what we really want to do is regularize the softening response of the concrete so that we don't have mesh sensitivity when we simulate compression controlled failures. And the best way to think about it is that I'm looking at modeling this post-peak response and the fundamental behavior of concrete, reinforced concrete, when it is failing in compression is a load versus deformation response, not a load versus strain response. So if you think about this uh, test specimen in the lab, which is representative of a uh, boundary element, when I squash it, the damage is going to localize, and I'm going to get a certain amount of deformation in that region. If I divide it by this gauge length, I get one strain. If I divide it by this gauge length, I get a different strain. So strain is a function of your gauge length or your element length. And so what I want to do is I want my stress versus strain to be a function of L gauge or L element. So here this is showing a uh, force-based element, you would have a fiber section here, you'd have a fiber section here, you'd have a fiber section here, and you can see how the concrete stress strain response changes depending on the length of, associated with that section. We give equations in some of our papers and in this document about how you define this area here and how you define the strain. Um, same thing happens when you move to a perform type model, uh, the length is the length of your element. Uh, to simulate crushing failure or uh, essentially loss of compressive strength in the steel, we have the steel buckling at a point that is the same strain at which the concrete loses compressive strength. When we do this, 
We get load displacement response that is independent of the number of integration points you use or the number of elements you use. Doesn't matter how long your elements are, doesn't matter uh, how many sections you have, you get the same load displacement response. If I don't do that, you see that I get, as I add more and more elements, I get a more and more brittle response. And if I only have one element, maybe in the bottom story of my building, I can get an incredibly ductile response that has perhaps no basis in reality. Um, looking at applying this approach for a force-based element to a number of different uh, tests in the lab, we can see that we can predu predict strength quite well, we can predict displacement at yield quite well, and we can predict displacement at onset of strength loss quite well. So that's our recommendation for doing this. Um, you can use that same approach with a lumped plasticity model. Now the length that you're using is just your plastic hinge length. Same thing works there. What we need now then is that's an approach for a wall that exhibits a tension controlled response and flexure or a compression controlled response and flexure. It will not work if you have a wall that is going to exhibit a compression shear failure. And so what this does down here is says how do we get, how do we figure out if it's a compression shear failure? So this is the cross-sectional aspect ratio of the wall, how long and skinny it is. This is the normalized peak shear stress demand as far as F prime C. The blue and the green circles are tests and, and finite element analyses that exhibit a, a flexural response, buckling, rupture, or compression buckling. The red are compression shear. So this line here, which is a function of cross-sectional aspect ratio and shear demand, tells you if you're down here, you're in a flexural response, pure flexure, here compression shear. Over here is hinge rotation versus probability of failure. Red, lower hinge capacity. Uh, blue and green, almost identical rotation capacity. So come over here with your wall, figure out whether you're red or blue or green. You come over here and you say, here's my limiting rotation. All of this information is put together in a table in the document. The first row of this table says, hey, I have a fl pure flexural failure, or I'm expecting pure flexural failure based on that previous plot. I'm a blue or a green dot. I can take some rotational values that are coming from either what I just showed you or some experimental data, um, and I can use just a hinge rotation, or I can use a fiber section and do my adjustment of the concrete response, and that'll work just fine. If I have a compression shear failure, I really need to uh, go through and use these rotational values. This model is okay, a fiber type model is okay up to peak, but my rotation needs to be defined using just the experimental data because my basic fiber model's not gonna represent that compression shear failure. And all of that works really, really well for planar walls. We've not uh, finished the studies on non-planar walls. So at this point in time, I'm saying that this is all future work in terms of identifying what, how you would use a rotational hinge model or a fiber hinge model for those uh, non-planar walls. And that is the end of my presentation.